I'm Shay, and welcome to my May monthly month May book May monthly book wrap up. Ready? Rolling. Starting off strong, aren't we, Shay? As per usual. I'm really gonna try to make this video not that long because I don't really have that many books to talk about. I only read five books this month. While I am kind of disappointed, I'm very much not surprised because this past month of May was so freaking busy. Most of the month I was either working or going to shows and when I wasn't going to shows I was mostly editing the videos of those shows to put up on my channel. Which now they're all up, now they're all live, they're in a playlist called Concerts which if you want to check that out I'll leave it up in a card above. There's some really awesome shows in there, some really awesome bands. But let's get to what you're really here for. First of all, some general stats. Four of the books that I read were physical books. One was an ebook from my library. Three of the books were nonfiction. Two were fiction. More specifically, one was manga and one was short story, I guess, kind of fiction. Let's talk about the short story-esque one first. Fittingly enough, I'm pretty sure it was the first book that I finished this month anyway, so it fits. The first book is An Elderly Lady is Up to No Good. Can you guess why I chose this one to read? Can you take a guess? Yes, it is because of the title. I was just searching my library's Libby app looking for something to read, and for obvious reasons, this title stood out to me. It wasn't very long, I think it was altogether 90 pages, and it had chapters, but it was more like in a collection of individual short stories that were about 10 to 12 pages apiece. I don't know how long a story has to be for it to be considered a short story. I was not an English major. Is this clear to you? But that's what I'm going to refer to it as. This collection of stories follows an old lady who gets up to no good. Now Shay, what is this no good that she be getting up to? How do I put this as delicately and in terms of service friendly way? She removes people from this plane of existence. That's all I'm gonna say. She removes people from this plane of existence and hopefully sends them to a higher one or a much lower one. She is not the judge, she is not the jury, but she sure as heck is the executioner. Our main character is an elderly lady living in a flat in Sweden, I believe it is. I'm pretty sure it's Sweden. She has no family left. She has no children of her own. The one bright spot in her life is that her flat, she gets to live in it rent-free for the rest of her life. Why? Because she's lived there forever. She's lived there since she was a kid with her sister and her parents. And then as the years went on and the building started to change hands, they had it written into the clause that her and her sister, I believe it was, would get to live there rent-free for the rest of their days. She has no more family left. Her sister passed before her and now it is just her living in her flat rent-free. God, I wish I was her. What does she do with her spare time and a little bit of spare money? Well, she likes to travel and she likes to get up to no good. She is clever. She is sly. She is spiteful. I think she was a really interesting and really intriguing main character by herself. But what I loved even more was getting to watch the stories build. Getting to see why she chose that person and why she was doing what she ultimately ended up doing and how. Because her motivations and her methods differed from story to story. Overall, I thought it was a very fun time. Very well done. I definitely want to try and find this book in a physical copy, if I can. Alright, this second book is part of a series that kind of has a little bit of a story behind it. If you don't know, I am currently in the process of moving out on my own for the first time. And where I'm moving out to is a family house where we've been storing a bunch of our stuff. As part of me moving in, I've been going through the process of decluttering that entire place, going through a bunch of my old stuff and seeing what needs to be thrown out, what can be donated, what I want to keep, blah 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 blah. I recently ran across a tote of a bunch of my old books. What did I find inside? A bunch of books that I remembered, but then I found some manga volumes that I swear to you I have no memory of at any point in my life ever getting or receiving. It is like they just manifested there. I swear to you, I have no memory of ever seeing them before. But the titles intrigued me. The titles themselves intrigued me, but what intrigued me more is that I had odd volumes of this series. Now granted, I haven't finished checking all the totes, so I don't know if the other volumes are lurking somewhere, but this particular series I'm about to talk about, I had volume 8 and volume 11, and I was like, so what I told myself was I'm going to try to find the first couple volumes of this series, hopefully for cheap, and then I'm going to read them, and if I like them, I will keep the copies I already have and try and find the rest. And if I don't, it won't be that big of a loss. I'll just sell all the copies that I have. Well, I went on Pango and I found volumes 1, 2, and 3 for very cheap and I snatched them up extremely fast. I have only read one volume so far and that is what we're going to talk about. This series is called Her Majesty's Dog and this is volume 1. 
honestly, I kind of have no words. I just want you to soak this in for a minute. Okay, minute over. Let's talk about it. I freaking love this. I do. It's not, it's not gonna surpass Trigun. It's not gonna surpass Dora Hidoro. But I love this for the time period it feels like it encapsulates, which is this early 2000s manga era before the manga bust and then the manga re-explosion in recent years. When I was a little kid, I used to read manga. I read Rave Master when I was like five or six, and then I read Sakura Tyson. And then there were many years where I did not read manga. And then my teenage years I picked it back up with Oran and stuff like that. This reminds me of a lot of the manga that came out when I was a kid. Because this did come out when I was a kid, or at least I should say it was published when I was a kid. Published in America at least. Yeah, it says this was 2005. So I literally, when I was like five or six. What is this series about? This series follows our main character, Amane. She is a super powerful psychic who they haven't really delved much into it yet, but she talks about things having names and names having power and words having power. So that kind of psychic being able to control and manipulate things like that, I guess. It sort of gives me Name of the Wind vibes. But like I said, I'm only the first volume in. I haven't gotten much more backstory than that. And who is this guy? Who Who is he? I'm so glad you asked. He's just her guardian demon dog. Yeah, I love it. I love it so much. I thought this volume was so cute. It was so funny. I am already obsessed. I sent my partner like 20 photos of different panels in this manga. If you want my true, weirdly honest opinion, I feel like this series manifested itself into my storage and it has just been waiting on me ever since. Why do I say that? Because so far, even just in the first volume, this has so many types of characters, so many tropes, so many dynamics and kinds of interactions that are my favorites. It has it all. It has so many of my favorite kinds of elements in literature, in writing, and I'm like, what the heck, where have you been? Apparently in my storage. Funnily enough, I think that if I had read this series when I was younger, I do not think that the elements that are my favorite things now, that I enjoy so much now, I would have enjoyed as much back then. But I think somehow the book gods knew that when I got to this age that I am now that I would adore these kind of things and they were like, girl, we got the story for you. It's just gonna be waiting. We're patient. Or you know, maybe Pache was like, I know what she's gonna be into. So you know what? Thank you, past Tiny Shay. Now what are some of my favorite elements that are incorporated in this book? I am so glad you asked. Namely, the demon dog himself. I am not going to try and pronounce his name because I will butcher it. I adore him with every fiber of my being. A new favorite. He is very funny. He is such a sundere. Sun sundere? Sundere. He reminds me so much of my boy Mammon from my little demon game. He just gives such Mammon vibes and Mammon is my absolute fave. So of course he scored automatic adoration points. I can't help it. I just love me a tall, light-haired himbo. I can't wait to get to the rest of the series. I hope the rest of it is as good. I'm not as hooked into the story yet, but considering that all the other elements surrounding it are just my favorites upon favorites, definitely gonna continue on with this. Now we are to the nonfiction. Finally, Shay. All three of these books have something in common, and no, it is not just that they are nonfiction. It is that they have to do with music. If you don't know, through the months of May and June, I am trying to read as many of my music theme books as possible, mainly because I just have so many that I've been meaning to get to for forever, but also because June is my birth month, and I freaking love music almost more than anything, and I thought, you know what? Let's make this month and the prior month all about those books about the thing that I really, really love. I love reading about music, I love learning about music, but mostly it's because they've just been on my shelf way too long and they need to be read. The first one is Read and Riot, a word I can't say because terms of service, Riot Guide to Activism. This book is a timely guide to radical protests with words, actions, and inspiration to ignite the power of the people and joyfully resist. This book was written by a member of a famous Russian protest band, again, who I cannot say their name because... YouTube, who was jailed after performing a protest song in a church in Russia. Put those together with context clues, you'll figure out which band I'm talking about. I really love this book. It was a really quick, insightful read. It would be an injustice to try and sum this book up, but I'm going to do my very quick best. What I love most about this book is the way that it was able to interweave and discuss the intersection of art, politics, 
the personal, the political, how the personal is political, how important a person's own personal narrative and experiences drive them to do what they do, and how that ties into the larger world and our community in general. And the author manages to do this by exploring their journey with these themes through their own personal narrative, through their own journey in life, through their music, through their art, through their protest, through just their overall lifestyle. I really love this book. I think it has a lot of great insight. I would definitely, definitely recommend. The next book, and one of the ones that I was most excited to get to in this challenge, is To Live and Defy in LA, How Gangsta Rap Changed America. I was lucky enough to be raised in a household where no genre of music was off limits. Therefore, I was raised with quite a bit of gangsta rap as a child. But I'm also a giant history nerd, and this genre of music is one that I just don't know enough about. I think I know the core history, the basic history, but not as much as I would like. And I thought this book would be a great place to start, and I was correct. The author says right at the beginning that it is not going to try and capture everything about the genre, that it is not going to be introspective, retrospective, analysis and philosophical take on the genre. It's not going to try and chase the evolutions all the way up until today's time and chase down all the little roots and all the little influences and what caused what and who and who. It was simply focused on the origins of the genre and a lot of the factors that contributed to it. The author themselves says in the beginning that it would be folly to try and capture the genre in all of its evolutions, especially in present time, because hip-hop in general, not just gangster rap, but hip-hop in general is changing so fast nowadays in so many diverse ways. That's why they decided to focus on more of the origins era. I not only appreciated that honesty, I appreciated that specificity. I learned so much not only about the environment that helped cultivate this genre of music, as in geographical place, but the social environment, the political environment. All of that that helped manifest this genre into the beginning of what it was to become. I learned so much about Southern California and all the different elements at play that I had never even thought of or frankly heard of before. It didn't look at these things as cause and effect, but rather as elements that often acted simultaneously. This book taught me a lot, not only about the influences, you know, environment-wise, but musically to the genre. The people, the pioneers, the players, I don't mean that as a joke towards the genre. I mean like pioneers, like the actors who helped in originating the earliest forms of it. Overall, this book just taught me a lot and I discovered a lot more music that I want to sit down and take my time and listen to. I would also like to find other reading material about some of the stuff mentioned in this book. I'll make another video talking about that if I ever do. But stuff about policing in Southern Los Angeles, the use of the battering ram, run DMC, all that kind of stuff. I want to look into that. Now, one thing I will clarify, I said that book wasn't a retrospective, introspective analysis. I meant that in the way that it's not trying to tie all these past events to how the genre is now. It's not saying because this happened, this is why this is happening in 2023. But it did do that for the past. For instance, it talked about a lot of the ripple effect that happened after the riot at the Run DMC concert in SoCal and how some of that rippling effect was isolating part of their core audience with disapproval and how gangster rap kind of filled that void that Run DMC left their audience with. So there is introspective analysis in that book, but I think it's very self-contained to the period that it's talking about. Just wanted to clear that up. A book that does have introspective analysis connecting the past to the present is the next book, and that is Revenge of the She-Punks, A Feminist Music History. And honestly, I can't give you a better summary than that. This book began as a project to document and explore the foremothers of punk, if you will. Because honestly, there's not been much documented about them or talked about them until recent years. However, this book quickly became so much more. It moved from not only documenting and exploring the foremothers of punk, who they were, why they did what they did, where they are now, what they're up to, what they were up to, everything they did. It also just became a wider exploration about the intersections of punk and feminism throughout the years. The author explores this intersection through the lens of different themes such as overall identity, money, love. They do a great job with at first explaining the relation of the theme to punk overall and then how it ties in with feminism and how those three things come together to make a unique thing, a unique blend of things. Part of how they explore this is through profiles of different artists, through different people. As I said, this book started as a way to document the 
foremothers of punk, some of the most influential women in punk. And a big part of this book is the constant reiteration about how punk and feminism themselves are always evolving always changing and possibly now faster than ever and how that's not necessarily a bad thing but while being conscious but while being conscious but while being conscious oh my god that doesn't even sound like a word anymore but while being conscious of all these changes and opening ourselves up to new discussions and new ways of thinking how we may have to be punk to punk and rip it all up and start all over again we should also try to be conscious of where punk and feminism has been not that we're glued to the past or bound by the past, but to say that it has had absolutely no influence would be a mistake. Even if we're breaking totally with tradition, even if we're totally breaking from influences and our foremothers, with how much non-male importance in the genre has been neglected, it's important to acknowledge its importance. I would say that this book is pretty accessible overall. I did read it a little bit slower than normal because I was really just trying to intake and digest all the information that I could. It's a relatively short read. It's, I think it's like 192 pages. Yeah, not counting the acknowledgements, it's 193 pages. Pretty quick, pretty accessible read. I'd recommend it. If nothing else, it will definitely give you a lot of new awesome bands and songs to check out, which is always a great thing. But I think you'll get more out of it than that because it has a lot of great lessons, a lot of great history in it. All right, ladies, gents, all configurations of being, that is going to be it for this monthly book wrap up. If you want to check out some more bookish videos that I've done, I have a full playlist just for that. It has all my monthly wrap ups, all my reviews, all my challenges. But as for right now, thank you so much for watching. If you ain't heard from anyone else today, I love you. Love and peace.